Hi, hey everybody. Today we're going to talk a little bit about plant families. So I'm going to use this as an opportunity to go through some plant family resources and some details about specific plant families uh, so you can start getting used to uh, identifying plants based on family. So the first thing I want to point out for field ecology students in 2020 is uh, the presence of these two files that have been made available to you. The first one is a plant terminology uh, file. And so make sure and take a look at that. Um, this will go through and tell you, you know, obviously differences between trees and shrubs aren't hard, but procumbent versus repent versus stoloniferous maybe terms that are hard for you to uh, recall immediately. And this sheet should help you do that. Um, there's roots, there's terminology related to leaves, um, leaf shape, uh, a leaf shape like lyrate, uh, maybe something that you're not used to thinking about unless uh, you spend a lot of time with um, some of our invasive plants at Tansy. Um, and other leaf shapes that may be new to, new to you, uh, along with the name. Reniform is a new one for a lot of folks, usually. Um, so different leaf shapes, um, different uh, leaf tip shapes, apices shapes, different types of veination. Okay. Um, Different types of hairs, there's about a hundred different words for hairs and the keying out of plants. And so um, make sure and take your time going through and, and uh, thinking about those and referencing something, a sheet like this might help. Um, and then finally, at the end, um, there's a significant amount on this sheet about um, floral morphology. So please go through that and take your time to kind of look up uh, terms related to floral morphology. Specifically, inflorescence types can be hard to remember. Um, what's a catkin? What's an ament? Uh, what's a spadix or a spathe? Uh, different types of inflorescences that are common include both simple and compound uh, inflorescences. And this would be an example up here of a corum, uh, a corum in the upper left, uh, branches like a racine but has a flat or dome-shaped top. A panicle is basically a series of raceme type inflorescences. A raceme has a central stem with the inflorescences coming off the, the side. A scape is a uh, enlarged stem that just houses um, flowers with no leaves on it usually. Um, we have spikes. Um, we have a number of different um, other pieces of terminology that will be helpful. This will go through symmetry. It'll go through differences in ovary position, superior ovaries, half inferior ovaries, or in wholly inferior ovaries. That is epigenous ovaries, perigenous ovaries, hypogenous ovaries. Epigenous being inferior, perigenous being somewhere in between, usually with a disc or um, saucer shaped hypanthium. And then hypogenous. Uh, are hypogenous, and hypogenous means superior. The components of the flower are important, and then I have a whole page where um, I've gathered together images uh, that show you details that I thought were particularly helpful in understanding what a carpal is, and where a carpal comes from, and how to think about the number of locules and segments in an ovary. The second file that's on here that's important to look at um, is a copy of some flashcards that you can get from uh, Lang Community College um, put together by Freeman Rowe at Lang Community College. These are uh, excellent um, guides to families. With the new flora of the Pacific Northwest, um, there are multiple uh, families in here that have been combined or changed. And so kind of keep that in mind. Uh, this is, um, some of these need to be updated now. Um, the edition I'm holding says April 1990. So uh, a little long in the tooth there, but still really very helpful. Um, and you'll see, um, you'll see those there. I, th I uh, really recommend these. Um, usually they come in colors so that you can tell the difference between a, um, uh, dicot and a monocot, so we have yellow for monocot in this case, uh, green for dicot. Um, 
Okay. With that, let's go through a little discussion of Okay, so here I've gone ahead and I've taken some of our plant uh, flashcards and a couple of images um, to help us think about families. And what I wanna do is I'm gonna march through the flora of the Pacific Northwest. And we're gonna start with some of the first families. And the very first family on page 77 in your flora of the Pacific Northwest is Papaveraceae, and Papaveraceae is the poppy family. So for each one of these, I'm gonna use the flashcards as a guide um, and information in the flora as a guide to start talking about what are the characters that we can use to recognize um, given families. If you've taken other classes at Evergreen State College, you know that we have, uh, we have uh, multiple faculty, one faculty in particular who's excellent at um, uh, going through and uh, uh, identifying plant family characteristics. Um, those plant family, um, so let me start over there. If you've taken other classes, you may have gotten sheets on plant family characters. It would be extremely helpful uh, to accompany what we're about to talk, uh, talk about. So some faculty are really good at lining out um, the characters of given plant families in kind of a spreadsheet format. This is gonna be more of a flashcard based approach. I wanna focus on key genera that you're likely to see in our region and key traits. So for example, let's start with the Papaveraceae. This is the poppy family. Um, poppies are really, really fun. Um, typically, uh, poppies tend to have four petals, which is really unique uh, among dicots. Um, there are only a couple families that reliably have four, uh, four petals. Um, and so you can start narrowing your list of dicots right away once you see that it's a four mirus plant or only has four petals. Um, so poppies are in this category. They also tend to have deciduous sepals. They tend to have two deciduous sepals, which is really interesting. Um, you can see that in this diagram here uh, where that little cap is meant to represent um, the sepals that used to be surrounding the unopened petals and then um, they become deciduous. So that's really fun, uh, fascinating. Um, you'll see that they frequently have numerous stamens, um, which is uh, fascinating. They can be as few as three, um, but uh, they tend to be numerous in many of our, uh, many of our plants. And then our pistils can be um, two to several uh, carpellate. Um, and of course, if you're familiar with uh, poppy flowers and poppy fruits, they can have really ornate fruits, which are uh, fascinating to see um, with all sorts of uh, interesting characteristics related to how um, the seeds to hiss. Let's look at a couple of our common uh, plants that we see in our region. Here's an example of uh, Dutchman's breeches here. This is not uh, a non-native. Um, this is frequently planted in gardens. But it looks a lot like a native Dicentra formosa. Um, which is known as the bleeding heart. So this one is a, is a non-native, but there's also a native. Another common non-native, but roadside weed is poppy. And that's the same plant that is shown here uh, as uh, Eschultzia. So Eschultzia californica is our uh, poppy, California poppy. Schultzia californica. Californica is uh, the species that's most common for us um, that you can find along roadsides. So beautiful example of Papaveraceae. One fascinating thing about Papaveraceae is that the flowers are not, you know, in poppy, they're actinomorphic, but clearly in um, something like Dutchman's breeches or bleeding heart, uh, they are not, they're bilaterally symmetrical or what we call zygomorphic. Uh, 
So, um, so the, the family can be either zygomorphic or actinomorphic. Okay, so that's good for that one. Okay, so we're gonna, let's move on to our next, um, let's move on to our next family. So the next family that's in here, so that's a fascinating family to look through. The next family that's in here that is probably important to you is the Bear Baradaceae. Oops. And the Bear Baradaceae um, is fascinating. This is the Barberry family, really interesting uh, little family. Um, has all sorts of interesting characteristics, but there's really only three genera to worry about and only a small collection of species to think about with this one. Here's our little card for Bear Baradaceae. Um, so there are a few hints here. Um, you might be used to thinking of Bear Baradaceae because you're used to thinking of uh, species like Oregon grape. Uh, Oregon grape is in the genus Berberis. Um, um, I'm so happy that it's put back in the, that it's kept in the genus Berberis in the most recent um, Florida of the Pacific Northwest. Uh, rather, it's been going back and forth between Mahonia and Berberis as a genus, and we're going to stick with Berberis uh, here for now. Um, Berberis nervosa, for example, or Berberis aquifolium are two common species. Uh, Berberis nervosa is frequently referred to as dull Oregon grape. Um, a couple other names for it. Another species that you might be familiar with is vanilla leaf. Vanilla leaf is a, a really interesting uh, plant in our region. It's not an evergreen plant like the um, Oregon grapes are. And this is Aclis trifilla. There's actually Aclis californica occurs in our region too, but trifilla is more common for you in uh, Northwestern Washington, if that's where you are. Aclis trifilla uh, is uh, easily recognizable based on the leaf shape. I'll see if I can draw it here for you. Okay, this is a horrible drawing. Oh, getting it all wrong. Uh, but you'll notice the leaves tend to be um, shaped some, somewhat like this uh, in Achilles trifilla, um, very large. And this is very common in our forests. Finally, the species that's shown here on the card is uh, inside out flower, Vancouveria hexandra. And Vancouveria is a smaller species that tends to look like its flowers have been pushed inside out. And so that's a, that's a really interesting one to uh, pay attention to. Um, so these can be shrubs or uh, perennial herbs that uh, die back every, every year above ground um, for the most part, um, more herbaceous kind of species. And um, they can be, uh, this is a, a fascinating little group to know. Um, and especially fascinating that you have this uh, harsh evergreen, you know, hardy evergreen plants like Oregon grapes in the same family as inside out flower and uh, vanilla leaf. I've also found this is a really good family to know as you travel internationally. Uh, you can find other members of the Bear Baradaceae in South America um, and other parts of the world. And uh, it's, a, it's a nice little touchstone for you. The next family to really talk about is the Ranunculaceae. Uh, 
The ranunculaceae have some really interesting and um, easily recognizable characters. And the ranunculaceae, of course, are the buttercups. I'm going to pull out my flashcards and we're going to flip to ranunculaceae. Um, but in general, it's good to know that these flowers can be either perfect or um, they can be dioecious. And this is the way that's represented in Hitchcock and Cronquist as a symbol. Ranunculaceae are interesting because they're a lot like Rosaceae, which is another family we'll be covering here in just a second, um, in that they have numerous stamens and numerous simple pistils. The numerous stamens and numerous pistils make them really easy to recognize because a lot of plants are more specific in the number of male and female structures that they have. Uh, but Rosaceae and Ranunculaceae tend to have numerous of both, while at the same time, they tend to have five mirus flowers. And so uh, when you look at the flowers, you're going to see five petals, and then you're just going to see a whole bunch of uh, stuff going on right in the center there. It's going to be a ton of, uh, ton of pistils, a uh, ton of stamens. So in Ranunculaceae, you can see that uh, here's an example of flowers. We have a kind of a palmately divided leaf that the leaves tend to be pretty finely dissected in Ranunculaceae, um, which are really interesting. And like the Papaveraceae, uh, Ranunculaceae can have many, uh, can have five petals, but then tends to have many uh, stamens. Okay, so many stamens. And I guess if you look closely, they tend to be in a spiral. Um, what I said about having many um, female parts too um, is not always the case. That can be as, as few as one to two, um, but they tend to be simple and you can have many um, like you often, often do. Uh, and I think in the buttercups you'll find that. Um, the fruits are akenes, uh, which may be interesting. It'll look like kind of a hard seed to many people or they sometimes can be uh, berries. The flower parts themselves are separate, and so they dissect separately, and they're not conning together, which is really interesting. I've noticed that uh, you know frequently on our buttercups and many of our other species, you'll find really different morphology in the ranunculaceae between the colline or the stem leaves and the leaves that are at the base, and so that helps you recognize the family. Um, like the Papaveraceae, these can be actinomorphic. But that's not always the case. Um, and we have some really conspicuous genera um, that have really um, elaborate flower shapes. Um, the delphinium fit in that category like ranunculus in that they can both be actin actinomorphic, or, or actually delphinium won't be, aquilegia will be. Um, but delphinium and aconitum have a tendency to be both zygomorphic. Um, looking through your book, you're going to find many examples of this, um, which are just fascinating um, to see. Um, Aquilegia, of course, I don't have a, I'm not uh, going to be able to draw this very well, but Aquilegia tend to have these really elaborate flowers. Let's see. can laugh at my drawing all you want, but I will try for you here. Um, I guess that's supposed to be an actinomorphic uh, version of that. It's not really coming out quite right. Um, 
So um, this should be a five mirrors, should be a five mirrors uh, flower and uh, really fascinating. The drawings in your uh, book in particular are excellent at showing this. So let's pull up one of those just for demonstration purposes here. So here you can see an example of uh, some of these flowers in uh, delphinium in particular that are just fascinating to look at. So again, uh, multiple, uh, multiple stamens, many times multiple um, female parts as well, uh, five mirrors flowers generally otherwise. And the one thing that I didn't uh, talk about in too much detail, but is typical especially of the buttercups is you tend to get this kind of little sack that will form at the base of the flowers, um, a little nectary. And it tends to, be, it tends to be kind of glossy. And so look for that when you're keying out a buttercup. That's the ranunculaceae. One flower that you may see if you're, um, you know, if you travel a lot in the mountains is past flower or old man of the mountains, which tends to look kind of like this in my rough drawing, uh, once um, all the flowers have fallen away. Um, it'll look like an elaborate cream colored buttercup um, when it's in full bloom. And then as it goes into senescence, um, you'll see these things uh, in a beautiful form uh, up in the mountains. So Clematis is in this group. That's a really interesting, um, uh, a really interesting ranunculaceae plant, very large group. Um, closely related to um, this group are, is the peony family and um, the current family. Um, and those are um, currants in some ways have flowers that actually remind me up close a lot of delphiniums. They're, they're kind of fascinating little flowers to look at. Um, and so that's worth your time. Uh, right now we have um, in the Northwest in uh, May and late April, we have Ribe sanguinium um, flowering quite a bit around, uh, around our area. So this is Grossulariaceae, the current family. Oops. How do we recognize the Grossulariaceae? What do we do? The flowers tend to be in a raceme. Uh, they tend to be two to several and um, the calyx tends to be kind of adnate to the ovary, which you'll notice if you if you dig into a current flower. You'll see that. Okay, here's our card for the current family. So how do we recognize things in the current family? Well, first of all, in our region, these are almost entirely going to be seen as shrubs. And so all of what you see are going to be shrubs the flowers are gonna to tend to be in racemes. And so you can see this here in this drawing where we have a central axis and then we have individual stems that are coming off in a raceme uh, shape. The ovary is inferior and many of the plants that we've been looking at so far have had superior ovaries. They're hypogynous. In this case, they're epigynous. And so they tend to have inferior ovaries. They're epigenous ovaries. The fruit is a berry. And if you look inside um, the ovary, if you do a cross section of the ovary, you'll find what's called parietal placentation. So placentation in a cross section of the ovary, which might look like this. If I have a, if I had an ovary, there's my stigma, 
and my ovary and I went and I took a cross section like this of that ovary. It might look something like this. I'd have some sort of a chamber. And if I have parietal placentation, um, it means that that placentation is generally on the wall. So uh, sometimes that will be important in this species and they'll ask you to actually uh, do that cross section and, and look for that, uh, for that placentation. The next family I'd like to talk about that's important for our region. So those are, those are our shrubs, our currants, um, a stream side family that's very common and really fascinating, I think, uh, because of their flowers is the Saxifragaceae. And the Saxifragaceae tend to be uh, small forest species that are really common in streams. Um, they have very, very ornate flowers. And I won't even begin to try to draw those. So uh, in order to represent those, we're just gonna have to go straight uh, to our book and look at our images there. Or look at our card here. So I'm gonna pull up a card here now. Um, you may already be familiar with the Saxifragaceae. Maybe you know uh, piggyback plant, youth on age, um, Tolmia, um, Telema grandifolia, Mitella. Uh, these are all common wetland plants uh, that may be familiar to you. Or you may know garden plants like uh, Saxifraga um, that people uh, frequently will plant, or Heuchera. Heuchera is a very common uh, garden species. So here's our card for Saxifragaceae. I'll zoom in on that a little bit. Um, this is what I mean by the ornate flower. So this is an ornate uh, actinomorphic flower in the Saxifragaceae, uh, which is really fascinating to look at. Uh, I tend to find that Saxifragaceae, I know, tend to have this kind of palmate venation. When you th uh, think about their leaves, and they tend to have these leaves that originate from a base and, um, and uh, leaving uh, a naked, uh, mostly naked scape with just small leaves on uh, the flowering uh, stem. Common genera, Saxifraga, uh, Telema, Tiarella, foam flower. Uh, Lithophragma is a really fascinating one, especially on the east side that you can find a lot of. Mitella, Heuchera, Tolmia. Let's talk about um, what's in uh, these flowers themselves. These are four or five mirrors, and most commonly five mirrors. You can see this in this example image where we have five lobes for uh, petals and sepals, which is which in this particular flower is, uh, is not easily recognizable right at the start. The carpels tend to be two or three. That means two or three ancestral leaves came together to form the ovary, but they tend to be partially united. Our stamens can be five, eight, or 10. So five would be a common uh, stamen form uh, represented by the um, flower that we're looking at here, where we've got one, two, three, four, five uh, represented, but sometimes they'll be double that. And so you'll get a second stamen uh, that is in between um, the petal lobes or uh, aligned with the, um, with the sepals. Um, they tend to be palmately veined, basal leaves common, and common along streams. So that's the Saxifragaceae. Great family, really fun. Um, for our next family, um, let's move out of the Saxifragaceae where there's some uh, really interesting, uh, interesting flowers. And uh, we can talk briefly about the Crassulaceae. The Crassulaceae are uh, important to recognize. Uh, these are the stone crops. Here's our card for stone crops. Um, so these are thick leaved succulent plants of dry places. Um, the carpels and the petals tend to be the same number, which is interesting. Um, these can be perfect or they can be dioecious. Um, the inflorescences tend to be cyme-like um, or the flowers can be axillary. And so what that means is either you have a plant 
with leaves and the flowers are coming out of the um, leaves or uh, out of the leaf axles, like this, or um, they tend to be uh, cymes. And uh, so a cyme just means that that terminal flower blooms first. Um, but it can be a broad class of flowers. So they have a, a kind of the terminal one blooms first and they come back. It's a determinant type of inflorescence. Um, they tend to be hypogynous. So they tend to have superior ovaries. Um, they're often showy um, and they can be anywhere from three to eight mirrors. And so in there is the possibility to be four mirrors or uh, apparently eight and sometimes even 12 mirrors. And so often multiples of four uh, or three, um, less, uh, less commonly. Um, the sepals are a little bit conate at the base, so you end up with these kind of inverted crown-like shapes for the sepals. Bad representation. Um, but the sepals tend to be um, somewhat, somewhat united at the base, uh, regardless of the, uh, of the, of the petals which uh, petals tend to be uh, distinct. So the petals are distinct, whereas the sepals more or less conny. However, um, the way that, um, let me clarify that real quick. They can also be, the, these can be conny too. So some of this can, you know, seem really confusing when you're just getting to know a family because you think, how am I ever going to recognize this family if it can be distinct or conic? The sepals are more or less conic. What does that all mean? Well, let's talk about actually recognizing this family. You will know that you're looking at something in the Crassulaceae when you're looking at um, really succulent plants generally growing in rock gardens or scree slopes um, with, uh, they tend to have leafy flowering stems uh, with some sort of uh, cyme-like um, character um, and um, the number of carpels and uh, so the number of ancestral leaves that formed the female structures and the petals tend to be matching so they tend to be in the same same numbers um, but I generally recognize the growth form of a sedum uh, before I'm digging into the flowers and in fact often you won't have the flowers for sedums uh, or for uh, things in the Crassulaceae, unless you're just at, right at the right time. Uh, and regardless, the flowers can be a little bit obscure. We have some other interesting families that are that come after um, that come after the Crassulaceae in your book. So make sure to stop and look at the Vitaceae, which is the grape family. Um, and the Zygophilaceae or the Caltrop family. The Zygophilaceae and Caltrop uh, family is the same family that Laria tridentata, uh, a somewhat well-known um, uh, dryland species um, is in. Um, and so uh, that's really interesting. We only have a couple species in that group. The next big family that we just have to talk about that is just uh, critical, um, to our broader understanding here is the Fabaceae. Wow, what a family. So uh, Fabaceae is really fun. This is the uh, legume family. And um, in an older text or in another key from another part of the country, um, you might find this um, referred to as the leguminosae. And so these are legume, Um, and um, the leguminosae would be, that's how that would be represented in an older system. Um, so good to know that it can uh, occur uh, that way. Um, but what can we say about the Fabaceae? Well, um, the flowers tend to be perfect. And they tend to have some easily recognizable characters. I find the typical pea flower tends to look something uh, like this, where I have a clear banner. Wings. Um, 
in a keel. Banner, wings, and a keel. My drawing might be hard to follow. So think of your typical pea uh, flower. Uh, and if you have to go grab one, pause the video and go out and find a typical pea flower. Go find a um, something from your garden, uh, find a scotch broom flower, uh, find any typical pea flower that you can, and uh, you won't be disappointed that you did. I'm going to load this one for you really quickly. It's going to be better than my drawing. We can zoom in on it as we need to. Here's a, a picture of a scotch broom. In this case, this is a scotch broom uh, that I found right outside of Olympia. And uh, scotch broom, of course, are normally yellow flowers. Um, but this one's really fun. Uh, because occasionally scotch broom can occur like this. They can be, uh, or has some orange and then they have a little bit of color variation, which is fun to find out there. Um, and uh, so as you're looking for scotch broom, don't discount them just because they're invasive species. They're really fun to find variation in. Um, this one is especially neat to see because uh, typical of what can happen in this group, um, we have one flower here that has been sprung by a pollinator, and then we have another one that is not, not yet pollinated. Um, which is really fun to see. I'm gonna clear some of my, um, clear some of my text here um, so we can talk about the characters in the photo that you see here. Here we are, okay. Um, so, this is much better than my drawing before. There's our banner. Here's our wings. And inside there, you can see the keel. So very typical for Thebaceae. But um, Thebaceae don't have to look like that. And so don't get fooled into thinking Thebaceae have to have a banner and wings and keel. In fact, they can be quite actinomorphic. Um, this is, a, of course, a zygomorphic flower, and um, it's also polypetalous. So the petals that you're looking at there come off separately, almost. So um, now I'm going to tell you uh, a little secret about the Thebaceae. Um, which is really interesting. Um, if I look at this, the sepals here, I'm going to find five. And in fact, I'm going to say the Fabaceae has a tendency to be five mirrors. Take a look at that flower and see how that could be. Okay, so the secret to this is that if you look closely at the keel, um, you can find that the keel is actually composed of more, more or less two uh, fused petals. And so we end up with two fused petals in what is a very uh, obviously bilaterally symmetrical uh, flower, not radially symmetrical. Um, there are a couple genera, though, in this group that can be actinomorphic. So um, you might say, is this actinomorphic? or zygomorphic. Um, it turns out it can be both. So most of the time in our region, you're going to find almost exclusively uh, zygomorphic individuals of this very large family. But occasionally, we can get uh, in the US, and as you get down in the tropics more often, you can find actinomorphic members. Um, one really common one for those of you who travel uh, to the southwest a lot. Uh, would be Desert Senna, for example. Okay, so that's a genus that you'll find. Um, okay, how do we recognize Fabaceae? Okay, so they tend to be, um, characters we'll find are we tend to have flowers with a banner, wings, and keel. Um, we also tend to have leaflets, so we tend to find uh, divided leaves. Let's take a look at our little card here and see what we can come up with. Okay, here's our card for the Fabaceae. And as you can see here, represented in the image, we have a very distinct 
banner wing and keel uh, shaped flower. Um, the two petals on that keel, something I forgot to mention before, the two petals on the keel tend to be held together by a fringe of hairs, which is <laughs> pretty fascinating. Um, they tend to be uh, plants that um, open in these pods. Of course, you're used to seeing what a legume seed uh, looks like, um, which is uh, really neat. Um, let's see. Um, Seeds can be one to numerous, of course. Um, they tend to be one carpelate. And so um, the seeds that they're showing here tend to have one carpel, which I think is actually really easy to, uh, it's actually an easy thing to use to help you understand what a carpel is, because once you see that seed, um, it looks very much like a single leaf that simply folded over. Um, and so, that one legume that is just stitched um, along a central suture um, just looks like a suture of two leaves that folded together and of course filled with uh, a row, a single row of seeds um, coming from an ancestral leaf. So very easily recognizable. Another thing that I find in Fabaceae is they tend to have leaflets and then occasionally they'll have twining tendrils like this uh, at the very tip of those leaves. And so that helps you recognize um, this group. Um, large genera in the Fabaceae include astragalus. If you get an astragalus, you're in for a long key generally. It's a very large key uh, in flora of the Pacific Northwest. Vicia are conspicuous roadside uh, species. Trifolium include uh, our, clo our clovers. Lupins are uh, really interesting. Uh, lotus species, melalotus species are tiny little herbs generally, so are the metacago, which tend to have um, conspicuous uh, palmately uh, shaped leaves. Cytisus, of course, is our scotch broom. Um, we have gorse um, and other conspicuous shrub species. Latherus, a conspicuous weedy um, pea-like species. Um, so lots of easily recognizable flowers in the Fabaceae for us. One final thing to talk about with Thebaceae has to do with um, the stamens. And so the stamens of Thebaceae can be really fascinating uh, because they tend to be fused together. And so we call them either monodelphus or didelphus. And what this means is that we'll have the stamens kind of fused together in a group of 10. I'm not gonna get all the way to 10 here, Sue, so. So that they're kind of in a little cone like this uh, within the flower. And so we have them actually fused, um, which is not common uh, for stamens. We're used to seeing stamens as always distinct. Um, so these would be monodelphus. Uh, make sure I get the spelling of that. Uh. Monodelphus, excuse me, monodelphus. Uh, make sure you get the spelling of that right. But occasionally, instead of being monodelphus, there'll be didelphus. And so you can also get a situation where most of your stamens are fused and then you have one individual that is separate. Let's say that's our individual there. Okay, the drawing's not great, but the idea uh, should be represented there that we have one distinct. Oops. Diadelphus, where we have nine fused, one distinct. Okay, one distinct. This can be a really important uh, differentiation within the group, within the Fabaceae and the keys. So you really have to dissect those flowers, um, which generally isn't uh, a problem. Um, occasionally, there are also details related to the, the shape of the stigma 
Um, and so that can be important to look at too for that group. Okay, that's our Fave AC. Family that is really fun to look at, the Rose AC. To represent our Rose AC today, I'm gonna add a little picture. We've already talked quite a bit about the Rosaceae um, because we spent some time keying out uh, plants in the Rosaceae. Here's a nice little picture of a strawberry flower. Um, and Rosaceae, of course, are easily recognized by several features. So one of those features is the five petals. One, two, three, four, five. This is generally five mirrors and five sepals. Here's a card of our Rosaceae. And there are several characters of Rosaceae that are really important in recognizing Rosaceae. Uh, first of all, it's frequently a plant that's thorned in our region when it's shrubby. So that's really helpful. Um, the five mirrors nature of the flower helps a lot. Another thing that helps us recognize uh, rosaceae is that it tends to have numerous stamens and simple pistils. Meaning they're not compound, they're not multi-chambered, they tend to just be simple uh, pistils. Um, the fruits tend to be uh, akines, uh, poems, or droops. Um, so they could be like the seeds on the um, uh, outside of a strawberry, which would be an akine. Um, they could be poems like an apple. They could be uh, a droop, um, more like a, a, a cherry. Um, so there are all sorts of different kinds of fruit shapes that, of course, you recognize uh, rose C in. But it's really this five mirrors, numerous stamens, numerous pistils that's going to key you in. And the difficult part of rosaceae is differentiating them, particularly the yellow ones and some of the white ones from ranunculaceae. So you have to know how to um, draw the bounds around those two different uh, groups for sure. Um, another thing though that is really typical of the rosaceae that is not typical of the ranunculaceae is that there tends to be a hypanthium or kind of a saucer-like shape that forms the receptacle receptacle that houses the ovary. So if I have, um, maybe I have, or, or ovaries. So if I have multiple uh, simple pistols in here, they tend to be housed uh, in a hypanthium like this. And then I have my bazillion stamens coming out all around here. I should have used different colors here to make this easier to see. I'm gonna have five petals. In the background, there's a fifth. Here's another one. <laughs> okay, maybe you can hang with that idea. So I've got five petals, I have numerous stamens, I have numerous symbol pistols. Um, but the key thing um, to recognize for the family is I also have this hypanthium or this saucer-like shape. Um, and I find that that's really, that really helps in recognizing rosaceae, especially in the field. And of course, uh, hypanthium in Hitchcock and Cronquist is frequently just gonna be referred to as a hypan, okay. Um, sometimes recognizing where that pistol is in that hypanthium can be kind of hard in this group. Um, that's because in flowers such as this one, which is what a lot of your apple and uh, pear fruits will look like, the hypanthium starts swelling into uh, the fruit shape relatively quickly. 
And so um, you tend to have this kind of swollen, partially inferior uh, fruit that looks a lot like a current fruit, for example. Um, but of course, this is, a, this is a rosacea. Another typical trait of the rosacea that's not necessarily true in all of them, but is uh, frequent is reflex sepals. And so you tend to find these sepals that come up and they're reflex sharply back. And that's a, that's a really typical feature of plants in the rosacea. Typical shrub genera include uh, Rosa, Prunus, Critigus, uh, ha um, Hawthorns, which are notoriously hard to key out, uh, Pyrus, um, and sometimes Holodiscus, and then Rubus, uh, I think we put in that group, especially since we have um, uh, some conspicuous uh, Rubus species um, in our area that can be shrub-like. Um, but um, two important species for us uh, are herbaceous species include Frigeria and Potentilla. There's also a shrubby uh, Potentilla. So that's good to keep in mind. That can also be a shrub. Um, and these are really fascinating. Of course, Frigerias tend to be white and Potentillas tend to be yellow. Um, and then there's another uh, species of yellow rosaceae that uh, you'll typically find um, growing low to the ground, close to the ground, um, uh, the geum or avens. And, um, and so I would add to this list, um, let's amend the card and a common one is the GMs. Um, so GM is another genus there that you're frequently going to see. I just saw uh, one, here it is in early May, I just saw one in, um, on the outskirts of Capitol Forest a day ago um, in full bloom. So these are, these are uh, frequent um, plants that you'll find. Um, Holodiscus um, here uh, is of course our ocean spray. Pay attention in this group to uh, shrubs with numerous, and I'll just use the infinity uh, sign, uh, small, inconspicuous, flowers. Uh, ocean spray really represents that. There are several other genera in this group uh, that can have inconspicuous but numerous small flowers in addition to the plants that can have very conspicuous uh, large flowers like uh, things in the genus Rosa, for example. Uh, but sometimes even our cherries have relatively inconspicuous individual flowers even if the entire inflorescence um, is very conspicuous. Okay. Um, that's what I've got for you. Okay. Enjoy your uh, keying. Happy, uh, have a happy time out there identifying your families. <laughs>